sticking with the concept of net zero emissions, many countries and companies have recently pledged to, to achieve this target. Uh, net zero is fast becoming the guiding principle, but we can't and we can't ignore that significance. Uh, but the goal is not enough on its own. So how do you think these promises move from talk into real world action? Well, we've got two processes going on hand in hand at the moment. We've got leaders in almost every sector of the economy establishing how they as businesses are going to be able to meet a net zero uh, uh, target, which means how will they produce profit? How will they employ people? How will they operate in a world which is deeply decarbonized? And so we've got company after company coming forward now saying that they can commit to a target, 2050, 2045, 2040, even earlier, depending on the size of the business. Um, and that's beginning to transform the conversation within each sector. Some of these are really hard things to do. How do you produce steel? How do you produce cement? How do you ship goods around the world? But we're seeing, even in hard to abate sectors, leadership being established. At the same time, we've got governments making their commitments. And this is the year when every government is supposed to ratchet up their commitment, their bottom-up commitment about how they are going to do this. How are they going to reduce their emissions? How will they emerge as part of a global economy which is zero net by mid-century? Now, that's been disrupted a little bit by uh, COVID. The bandwidth, the managerial bandwidth in many countries is severely strained, especially in middle-income and low-income countries. But, but this is the year when those plans are supposed to come forward. Let's shift to the concept of a green economic recovery. Rachel, I know you've made the case for that. Why? What is it? And why do you think it's important? Well, the economic uh, recession, uh, depression in some parts of the world uh, uh, brought about by the COVID pandemic has sort of knocked everybody back. It's probably going to push more than 100 million people back into poverty. So we have to sort of, uh, sort of dress ourselves down, stare at this problem and work out how are we going to, as we recover from the pandemic, achieve two core goals. One, deeply decarbonize. How do we use the opportunity of having to uh, instigate all kinds of reform measures and recovery measures to be able to make sure that we're on a different trajectory coming out of this crisis. So use the opportunity of a crisis to get back on track. But at the same time, the recovery has to work better for everybody. Embedded in the Paris Agreement is not just the idea that we reduce emissions, but that we leave no one behind. So we need to have energy and food systems which are resilient to climate change, which are low carbon, but which also work for everybody. We need food systems which are not going to produce uh, a lot of carbon emissions, but which actually give people a chance at a healthy, affordable diet. So in this moment of crisis, we have that opportunity. And the good news is that there's actually quite violent agreement amongst economists and others around the world that there are short term measures that can be taken, which will get more people back at work, which will instigate recovery in the economy, but which also are really good things for a net zero global economy in the 10, 20 years. So for example, refurbishing the built environment, all the jobs that can be created from making our buildings more efficient and passive in terms of their carbon balance. Those are good quality local jobs can be created now and which will put us in a much better position for the long term as well. Jerry, I'd like to bring you in on this. What do you think about the concept of a green recovery and it actually getting implemented in some of the biggest economies in the world? I'm thinking specifically of the United States where the concept of a green recovery is somewhat politicized. So what do you think about the real, real world uh, odds of this happening? Well, I think they're pretty good, largely because we, we're living through a pretty radical reordering of facts on the ground, even in the United States, where I'm looking at my window here in Ottawa, Canada, and the sky is sort of a beigey pink color because of wildfire smoke from um, uh, biblical event of, of uh, wildfires in California. Uh, I think that there's a really good chance of it. Governments are going to have to walk and chew gum at the same time uh, to a large degree, and that's that's uh, that's something that they're accustomed to doing in times of crisis. I was wondering if, Rachel, you might want to reflect on, uh, given that this is, we are talking about the proceedings of the UN this week, uh, is it perhaps, um, if there's any silver lining in this, cloud, in this cloud, is it perhaps a stroke of luck that COP26 has been put off a year? Yeah, I think, well, I think that's a, a a good point. I, I think we wouldn't have ever wanted um, uh, something like this to make people really think through the fundamentals, but it is 
clear it's given the opportunity for a, a, a green new deal in, in, in Europe. And of course, the proof of the pudding is an implementation. But what they've put forward seems to make good sense uh, that we've just had a, a China uh, EU um, bilateral and the, the news coming out or the representation of what was discussed by the Chinese this week would indicate that, you know, there is some uh, agreement there uh, about the need to uh, to really drive through and meet um, medium term goals in terms of carbon emissions. I think everybody's watching to see what happens uh, in the United States in November, of course. Uh, but I, I think that that pause was important. But we do have a, a really in, important issue in front of us, which is how do you help those countries which still need to grow their economies, which still need to build uh, new jobs for the future? How do we help them at a time when they are indebted? They will be expected to be become more indebted in order to work their way out of the economic crisis. So for low income and middle income countries, where is the solidarity and how are we going to be fit to help them uh, get onto a, 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 a lower carbon course and do that in the teeth of, of, of what is proving to be a more global and deeper economic impact of COVID than we've experienced in, in modern economic history? Rachel, to round this out, you know, multilateralism is against the ropes. And so I'm wondering if you see opportunities to bring nations back together in global cooperation. I know you mentioned some countries coming together there, but these are somewhat tense times with a lot going on around the world. So what do you think the prospects are for really building a robust global community once more? I would like to think that we can do two things at the same time. One is that we put scaffolding around the processes that we use for international cooperation right now. So scaffolding around the World Health Organization, around um, the G20, frankly, and the G7, where international cooperation on an economic front has normally taken place. But that we can actually have a little bit of a moment to think about the blue sky and what do we need international cooperation to look like going forward. So can we solve for the, pro the crisis of climate and the crisis of indebtedness and, and in lack of inclusivity in economies at the same time? Can we get all of the major actors around the table? When we created the Bretton Woods institutions uh, more than 75 years ago, when we created the UN 75 years ago, it's its birthday this week, then uh, the world was a very different place and who needed to be at the table was different. And so is this a moment when we can get the leadership together uh, and sit around and think about how do we build those institutions to cope with a decarbonizing economy that has to work for more people more fair for the future while the institution right now at least the first stages of recovery. We have to be able to do both. That's the call to leadership this week in New York. Rachel Kite, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.